All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, week five of giving out grades for putting blocks together in Minecraft and then the CS department tells me to stop. Uh, today, we'll be talking about more computery stuff. I think this is neat, actually. So, so far, we've built a bunch of stuff that's kind of um, put us towards building a computer in Minecraft. Um, but we've really only been building like a calculator sort of thing, right? This is where we start getting into like the real computery, computery stuff. So we'll, we'll get a real world example in here um, today and kind of kind of loop it back, kind of see where we're, we're getting at with that. So that is exciting. Um, and without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, just want to comment on the presentation real quick. This is the, um, <clears throat> the presentation from last year, but I'd like the diagrams and how they look. So I just decided to keep it. Um, generally, I think I will use the last year presentations, um, unless there's like some big change I need to make just because the diagrams are neat. They're a little more verbose than usual though, but they're designed so that you can kind of read the slides later because we used to not record lectures. So they're kind of designed so you can read the slides later and kind of get a synopsis of what happened. So we'll see how this works. Um, if you do have any comments on like the slide format, if you want them to be like less verbose and look more like last week's, then just, you know, go ahead and drop it wherever. Cause the end of the day, we're just kind of trying to tailor this class to, to everyone who's taking it. So leave your comments as you will. Right on. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Project four, Ashwat is working on putting that out. I am aware that project three just came out recently, so probably won't be looking at project four for a little while. Um, rest assured that we will space out those due dates, like I said, making them pretty, pretty doable, pretty easy to do. Um, we do have more weeks in this semester somehow. No idea how that happened. Um, so, Time should not be an issue. Um, and your midterm will not be, I mean, I'm saying the word midterms, don't panic. That will not be a discussion until next week. So you have at least a week before we start talking about it. So just no worries. Um, we are still kind of chilling on that front. And generally the midterm is not that difficult in this class. Um, and your points usually are like, you know, they're not in danger uh, from the midterm. So just throwing that out there, it's meant to be a nice little test of your knowledge, a neat little set of applications of them. Um, it's not meant to completely throttle you or destroy your grade. So I guess rest assured on that front. There's our kind of agenda for the day. Um, that being said, announcements, Project 4 has not yet been released. Um, it will be released soon. Um, and you'll find everything you need under the week five section of the course website. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, at the end of lecture, probably. But let's go ahead and get into the content that we have for today, which is muxes and demuxes, right? So this is where we start getting into kind of this, this sort of computer hardware thing. And I'm sure that's to, um, to nobody's surprise, because at the end of the day, this is sort of like computer architecture, but in Minecraft. So we're kind of going away from the whole calculator side of things now. Uh, I think you'll find this interesting and somewhat refreshing. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, I got a little little blob of wires here, right? So I, I just threw this up here because I wanted to say, okay, we've started creating circuits that have like a lot of wires associated with them, right? Uh, and it turns out extending like all of these wires is like very expensive and, and space consuming, right? The reason I've got all these wires here is you remember those encoders and decoders we had, right? Now, specifically when we were converting from decimal and to a decimal, you saw that um, over here, oh, whoops, over here, you know, only one of these wires would be on, but we have, like, you know, if we wanted to cover one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven signals, we'd have seven wires. Now, that's fine if we want to just cover seven signals, but what if we had some sort of encoder or decoder that dealt with decimal, uh, the order of, like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, right? Or maybe a few hundreds. We'd literally have hundreds and hundreds of wires. And that we simply cannot do, right? So think about that. Um, I want you to keep like these examples we're going to go through in, in lecture right now are kind of small because I kind of want to get the point across and, and teach you the basics of, of what these actually are. But I want you to think about how they will scale because that's where the real beauty of this stuff kind of comes in. So so keep that in mind, right? Just to scale these up. So not just seven wires, but like hundreds of wires. Um, and like I said, extending all of those wires is pretty expensive and space consuming given just how many of those that we actually have to build. So this phenomenon is known as having like many parallel signals, right? And the long and the short of it is they just use a ton of wires. Um, and at this point in the class, I'm sure everyone is well aware of how much effort it takes um, to place, you know, 
an extra line of wires in Minecraft. You had wires, repeaters, that whole sort of stuff. It really makes you wonder how much harder it is to implement, design, and account for in real life. Right, so if we're going to be extending these wires over long distances, are there maybe more efficient ways to handle that many potential signals? Um, you know, and it turns out, and there's no, there isn't a scene of the lecture. No, there is, right? Um, the answer can be found using multiplexers and demultiplexers, right? Uh, and that's the key to today's lecture. The reason we said muxes and demuxes at the beginning are because the two terms are interchangeable. A multiplexer is often referred to as a mux, and a demultiplexer is often called a demux. The question is, what are they? Right, we kind of talked about them, beating around the bush here, so let's talk about what they actually are. Well, um, the need for multiplexers arose due to the presence of a certain problem in digital circuit design. Right, I want you to think back to our bus designs and specifically our encoders and decoders. Now, it turns out that there are a lot of different circuits, not just these, that would require us to have a fair amount of parallel wires and parallel signals, right? So it is a common problem in digital logic design to have to deal with a multitude of parallel signals, um, you know, that whole spaghetti of wires. And it turns out there are efficient ways to deal with that, right? So, I mean, the title of this slide is Need Necessitates Solution, which is completely true here, right? We kind of need a solution to this problem. We don't want to have so many wires all the time. So multiplexer, or MOX, takes a bunch of parallel wires and condenses all of them down to a singular out wire and a few select wires. And a demultiplexer, or DMUX, takes in a singular in wire and a few select wires and sends the in signal down the appropriate output wire. Right, now this might be a little confusing to think about like right now, so I've got a diagram coming up, no worries. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about limitations as well. So without further ado, let's take a look at the diagram, right? Here's what we've got. Now this, keep in mind that this, I hate how this, I'm going to just lock my mouse wheel here. Okay. Keep in mind that this is a small example, right? Now we're going to work with small examples, but just this sort of thing can be generalized to a much bigger example. And that's when the efficiency really kicks in, right? So here we've got four wires coming into the MUX um, and that gets condensed to one out wire, right? And then four wires coming out of the DMUX on the other side. Um, and that gets uh, kind of expanded again to uh, four output wires after getting one input wire. And notice how we've got these two select wires coming in on both sides here. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but really what I want to emphasize is that we, instead of having to carry four wires all the way across this, we technically only need the singular output wire, and we also want to be able to carry the two, like, you know, select, um, select wires across, and we'll kind of talk about why that is. But we want to make sure that both the in and the outside know um, what the select wire values are going to be. Um, but again, right? I know right now, this has only been condensed down from four wires to three wires, which is not that great of an improvement. But I'd again like you to think about the larger scale, right? When we talk about what these select wires actually do um, and think about how that would help us conserve wire amounts as we get to much larger examples. All right, so the out wire is the easiest part to understand here. That's the signal we ultimately want to transfer across. As for the select wires, they're a little more nuanced, right? Um, so if we were to have four inputs and four outputs, can anybody guess why we would need two select wires for our mux slash dmux combo? So we can throw it out there. So we'll see if we can get in lecture questions. Don't be shy, kids. But also, I don't blame you. It's in the morning and it's Friday. No idea. Okay, no worries. That's all good. See, the, the goal here is to take this signal, one of these four input signals, right? Now keep in mind, that's the whole nuance here. One of these four things coming in is going to be on. And our job is to transport that signal across and tell the DMUX which one of those four signals was on as well, right? And that's kind of what we're getting at here. So instead of carrying these four wires across and you know obviously if you turn one of these wires on the other side's going to know if you just have four wires across we want to emulate that functionality um, with the mux and demux so here's here's what we're going to do right we want to signify which of the four inputs are being transmitted across the output channel 
and we can go ahead and represent which one it is um, using binary. And that's the real key here, right? I want you to understand this will only really work if um, you know only one of these is on, right? In other words, we want to know on this side whether wire one is on, whether wire two is on, three is on, or four is on, right? And that's why I said we keep going back to the idea of, of encoders and decoders, because that's a perfect example of why, why we would only have one of these things on, right? Um, so that's something. Um, and again, we're using the select wires to do so, right? We can represent that using binary. So we're going to walk through a few examples here, and that might be um, somewhat helpful in understanding what exactly these uh, muxes and demuxes do. So here, let's say we wanted to transmit across to the out what the signal in this wire would be, right? So if this was on, then the mux would say, OK, we'll send that one, that one byte across from, from here, the one bit across here and bring it out on this side. And the reason it's coming out on this side is because both the mux and demux know, OK, 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, and that specifies that the uh, the zero, the first kind of bit here, is the one that the mux and demux are working with. Similarly, what if we wanted the mux and demux to detect what signal was coming in through um, this first wire here? Now think about it for a second. Take a quick guess, right? Um, but here, if you provide a one for each of these select wires, then suddenly the mux says, OK, you've given me a 1, so I know that I'm transmitting um, this one across. And in my diagram, I'm kind of excluding the fact that both of these, these sides, they both need to know um, that 0 and 1, or like that these select wires values, um, are consistent across both. right? And that's the sort of key here. Um, into the mux, you're feeding a signal, but you're also telling the mux, okay, I'm sending you the signal for 0 and 1, when none of the inputs going into the mux are on. Um, actually, yeah, so uh, I'm glad you asked, but in that, in that case, right, it's kind of like this case, except none of these would be on at all. Um, it would be set to a default value, right? If we're sending no energy at all into the mux, um, then we're telling the mux, okay, well, you're kind of like, right now you're in like your your dead state where that's stuck at zero zero, um, and no signal is coming through zero zero. So it basically acts like just a a blank wire, right? Nothing will ever be going through it at all, and that's kind of the beauty of it. So if nothing's going into it at all, it just acts the exact same as. So that's that's the thing. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right, right. Um, let's clarify that. So zero zero wouldn't actually implicate that this red signal is on, right? Zero zero is kind of saying, okay. Um, we want to take whatever is coming in from that first line right here, and whether it's on or off, send it down this middle, right? Does that make sense? So just to clarify, these select wires can be any value. The red doesn't necessarily mean power in this case. It just means that whatever information is coming down the red, so it doesn't, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. It doesn't matter what the select wires are, right? Because essentially what the select wires are telling you is over here on the left side, let's talk about the mux and demux like kind of separately and kind of get this idea across, right? On the left side, when we give the mux zero, zero, we're saying, okay, mux, I want you to take whatever's coming through the zeroth wire here and send it straight down the out wire. Excellent, Irene. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of why, even though in this diagram it might be slightly misleading, right? And the the reason I'm not like a perfect friend, um, the reason I'm not sending like these two wires across is that um there could be a chance that both of these mux and demux might already inherently know um that they want zero zero, right? Um. So we can also do something where we send across um the select wire signals, right? That is also completely an option. But a generalized solution kind of dictates that we don't necessarily need to send both across because as part of a larger circuit, right? They don't these these don't directly need to come across here. Um, but I just do want to clarify that we want to send the out wire across, like I said, and we also want the select wires, you know, sometimes to be sent across as well because we want consistency on both sides. So the second wire was on, but the select wires were zero zero. They're absolutely correct. Yep. So if the second wire was on, right, the mux would be getting in 
this signal right here, but our little zero zero here dictates that, oh, we don't care about anything else coming to the MUX. We only care about lane, the first lane, right, coming into the MUX. So we'd only send across the information going in the first lane. Yeah. Great. The select wires question is also great. We're going to talk about an example that maybe might clear it up a little bit. Um, but you can see, Brian, <clears throat> and everybody else, as we move across here, right, these red wires sort of dictate um, where the information will be coming in and where it will be going out, right? So you notice that the select wires are always the exact same <clears throat> on both sides. Obviously, if we consider the case where the select wires are different, if we had one zero and zero one here, um, that would be erroneous, right? We'd kind of be saying, okay, whatever comes in here is one zero, but then you, you spit it out as zero one. That wouldn't really do anything for us. Our marks wouldn't really be decoding anything, right? <clears throat> Yeah, sure. The select wires are for determining which of the inputs and which of the outputs um, are like kind of valid in this case, right? So let's, Richard, kind of take a look at these examples that we've got. Notice that we're iterating through binary, right? Um, so we got 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. In binary, that's, uh, that's 0, 1, 2, 3, right? And that's kind of what we're getting at. Over here, we're telling the mux, okay, take whatever's in the 0 wire and send it across right? Next, we're saying, okay, I've changed my mind. Take whatever's in the one wire and send that across. Um, and similarly here, take whatever's in the two wire, right? And send it across. And finally, take whatever's in the three wire and send it across, right? So that's how the MUX works. And, and the DMUX kind of works similarly. That is, yeah, so so great, great point. This is kind of along the same lines as the Irene, as the iron question. And the reason I'm not extending it here is because sometimes in some circuits you may want, you may already know um, that you're taking from some inputs. But, you know, in this case, if we're just looking at a um, the whole circuit as a whole, it was kind of misleading here. But yes, we will be extending the uh, select wires across, right? And the only reason we're doing that is so that MUX and DMUX both know which select we're doing, right? So hopefully that makes sense. And the reason I keep bringing up that case where perhaps these two would both know is that sometimes in general circuits you might have like a a manual override. Somebody might be pressing a button on this on this side to dictate what the DMUX is pulling out. You know, um, there, there are general cases. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, optimally here in this example. Um, I wouldn't think of it as having to carry these across necessarily. You could if you wanted to. Um, in fact, that's probably better for the scope of what we're doing. Um, it's just that select wires need to be the same on both sides always. So actually, yes, let's think of it that way. Let's think of carrying the select wires across. Um, and, you know, obviously here, that goes from four wires down to three wires. But I'm sure everyone is aware of the nature of binary. We'll talk a little bit about the actual math that makes it a lot more efficient in a bit. Um, but this becomes super advantageous. Uh, so does anybody have any questions? Again, let's, let's make sure everybody's all good on this um, about how the MUX and the DMUX kind of work, their essence, right? Um, the select wires, how they dictate the information. Again, I want to clarify that the red does not mean like on signal. The red is kind of just the path of information, right? If, if let's, like, let's say this is on, right? If the select wires are such that this is going on right here, then only information passed through this wire will ever get out through that wire. None of these other wires are ever going to be on, right? Information can only be sent across this pipeline. So hopefully that's clear. I'll, I'll take questions for a second. Feel free. Okay, cool. I think I think we should be okay on this. Um, oh, Bernie, yes. Ah, so the select, excellent, excellent. Let's talk about the DMUX, right? It's the exact opposite of the MUX. <clears throat> so it might not be super clear at first, but the DMUX basically is getting a signal coming in, right? That's kind of the only input that we're getting at first, just one potential signal. And our select wires are saying, okay, DMUX, you're getting perhaps some sort of signal coming in. Now, what your job is, is whatever that signal is, zero or one, I want you to send it out of the wire specified by select. So in this case, if DMUX is getting in some information um, and it's also getting one and zero in select, um, are the same for MUX and DMUX. Uh, that's because we want it to stay consistent on the left and right. Right, 
we want the three, the signal coming in at three, to come out at three on the DMUX as well, or at two in this case, um, to come out on the DMUX. Does that make sense? So whatever's coming in on the second wire here, but would it still work? Um, still, ah, so you're absolutely right. That's that's the nature of the hardware, right? So perhaps you're saying um, if we had one zero here and maybe we had zero zero here, you can imagine exactly what would happen. Uh, whatever information was coming in here, we'd get it through and then our DMUX would spit it out on the zero lane. Now that would work, that would totally work. But the question is, is that useful to us at all? Uh, and the answer is no, right? So it would work. It would work. You're totally, you're totally valid there, right? There's nothing stopping us from changing these like values, the select wires. And I guess it's kind of my fault for not mandating that they're the same here. But I mean, it's kind of important to know. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Sure. Sure. All right. Sweet. That's kind of how these multiplexers and demultiplexers work. Um, so let's go ahead to the next thing, right? Immediate observations. So although it was just condensed from four to three, we do need less wires to carry signals across long distances. This is good. This is good, right? The only limitation is we can only carry one signal across this channel at once. That may be bad. That means that with these four wires before, if we just had four running across, we could go willy nilly. We could represent, you know, binary numbers, uh, maybe some other like simultaneous signals. Here, we really only get the benefit of using, of getting one of these across at once, right? So we're saving some wires, um, but we can only, we can only really carry one signal across this channel uh, at once, right? Um, and the summary is, you know, it's all about trade-offs. Um, information in terms of bits is by definition not, I guess, not more compressible um, than this, right? So we can't represent four bits with less than four bits. That would be ridiculous and also kind of cool. But, you know, the best we can do is we can take, you know, the we can leverage the fact that only one of these is going to be on at one time, right? And then condense the wires ourselves, right? So in that sense, we're not really breaking any like laws of physics or anything. We're not saying we can represent four wires with less than four wires. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying on the condition that one of these four wires has to be like, you know, on and everything else has to be off, right? So on the condition that one is on and the rest are off, then we can leverage that condition to structurally improve our design um, and kind of make a trade off there, right? So we can only transport one signal across at once, but if you take a look at our examples later, we'll be saving a, a heck of a lot of wires, right? So the reason that this works, the reason this is very cool is that you'll notice that in a lot of cases, we don't care about all of the wires coming across at once. Sometimes we only care about one of those wires, right? We only want to know um, which one of these is on. We don't want to know the combination, the sum total of all of these, right? I know we worked with adders and multipliers and we're used to seeing binary numbers being sent across these channels, but a lot of the time, and I want to get us back to that idea of encoders and decoders, because that's a great example of this. We only want to know, okay, which one of you dudes is on, right? That's the only thing we want to know. And for there, muxes and demuxes are highly useful. In fact, when we get to writing this project, um, project four, you will find an excellent use um, for mux and demux. Right. So that's my kind of spiel there about the trade-offs. Uh, any questions? Feel free to jump in and interrupt, by the way, anytime. This is this is not like a very formal lecture. Really have no idea where they pay me for this. Right on. So let's let's go ahead and, and hit this in-depth thread, because I do want to talk about why we, we just screwed around with four and three wires. We definitely have much more that this powerful idea can do for us. Um, so first of all, let's talk about the actual building of it. Right now, all we got is a trapezoid, right? It's not very cool and not very Minecrafty. It's just an abstract concept. So I want you to think about it, right? I've kind of laid out the wires here with a little bit more of a specific description of what they're all called. Um, and notice how I'm starting with a zero index here. That's to leverage binary, right? Like we talked about earlier, zero, zero here corresponds to zero input wire, zero, one here corresponds to the one wire, um, one, one um, to the three wire, uh, so on and so forth. Right? Or I think I missed the two wire in there somewhere, but I, I hope everybody kind of knows what I'm getting at. So keep in mind that I'm zero indexing for a particular reason here, and the select wires represent binary here at the output, right? 
And that's kind of the basis of how this would work. So I want you to think about specifically how we messed around with encoders and decoders and think, how would you build it using the logic gates that we've, we've learned, right? And it turns out it's not that bad. It's kind of like a weird decoder slash encoder for the mux and demux, right? Check it out. You're seeing a lot of this neat and structure that we've seen earlier, but really all we're doing is we're anding um, these input signals with, this, with the right select wires so that only if the right combination is on. So for example, if we ever wanted something to go down, if we wanted to have the output represent what's going on in the A channel, we would simply say, okay, well, if A is on, well, don't send that across just yet. We also want to check one thing. We want to make sure that not S1, not, not select one and not select two are also true, right? And only if these two select wires are off, if they're set to zero, we'll send whatever's in A across, right? So notice how these are AND gates, right? Because the default is zero. In other words, we will only send a positive signal across if the right select wire is on, right? Naturally, we don't care about anything else. Um, if all of these are off, then we have nothing to worry about. The default state here is off. So that's kind of the beauty of the binary here. So I want us to just kind of go back and forth between these two things, kind of see how that would work, right? Logical circuit, the trapezoid. Logical circuit, the tra okay, that's enough of that. Um, and here is the complement, right? Now I call it a complement just because I've been kind of throwing the word logical complement at you a lot of the time. I sort of use the definition a little loosely, um, but this is the one to four demultiplexer, right? And as you can imagine, figuring out the internal components of this is, is very similar to what we did for the MUX, right? And that is the same way we kind of went from encoder to decoder, the same way we're kind of getting the logical circuit for the DMUX, right? So again, we're getting one input, and we're getting these two select wires. Based on these select wires, we're saying, okay, whatever is coming in through input, I want you to send it out a specific output, right? So that's how the demultiplexer works. Very similar to how the multiplexer kind of is structured. So again, we'll take some time to go back and forth. I'll be posting these lecture slides as well. So feel free to take a look at them on your own time. Um, Yo, Aki, my bad. Oh, I was hey. grading. I was grading two fifty stuff and completely lost track of time. Oh, That's dude, my bad. you're totally fine, man. <laughs> yeah. You're all good. No worries. I was just worried. Cool. Hope oh, no, good. We're Sorry about that. All good, bro. Um, yes. We look. That is where we are with the multiplexer and the demultiplexer. Does anybody have any questions on these logical circuits? Oh, yes. Excellent. Oh, my boy, you make me so happy. This is exactly what our next slides are going to be about. Okay, okay, upscaling is great. And that's what we're going to talk about, right? Because I'm sure all of you have noticed, including you, Brian, that we are just here. This is three wires, and it's using a lot of effort to just get to four wires. That's not very cool. Same thing here. Just uh, we're taking um, these two additional wires here, these two select wires, and kind of setting them across along with the output. So really, we're just going from four to three here, right? So the real beauty of this and the reason I didn't upscale for these examples is just because it's, I think it's a lot easier to understand when we use these small examples, but when we upscale, we get some massive stuff done, right? And these numbers you're throwing at me here, we're, we're gonna go ahead and formalize them in a second. So just give it a, give it a moment, but you are on the right track. Um, and that is in applications, right? Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about that, right? How useful are these anyway? As it turns out, there are very clear mathematical reasons why. Right, and Brian, this is exactly what you were getting at. Um, but but let's talk a little bit about why we would need such massive multiplexers, right? So consider the computer. CPUs really need to leverage muxes and demuxes in order to process instructions and data efficiently. And by efficiently, you know, I mean fast, but I also mean with <laughs> without so many wires, right? So think of the ALU, right? We got a lot of wires there, right? And for a lot of those, we really don't need to check whether all of the wires were on, right? I mean, I talked about the encoder and decoder before, so I'll spare you the, the repeat of, the, of that, that sort of spiel, but that's kind of what we're getting at here. Um, now, if you think back to 216, which ITA4, um, so I, actually, no, I don't think any of you are, are in my section. Oh, yeah, didn't we establish that everyone here has already taken 216? So hopefully I can skip some of the stuff there. If anybody has, oh, still in it, excellent, amazing, okay. Um, let me see. So I guess we can kind of we can kind of hit this at a 
Midterm was yesterday. Yes, it was. I proctored it. It was very long. <laughs> yep. Uh, so you should be all good with the basics, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, especially after you just did the math lawn thing. So no worries. Um, kind of think of it that way, right? Actual data comes from memory locations, right? Oh, actually, I'm not sure if you did the math lawn thing. I don't know if that's to you. Um, but let's talk about general memory locations, right? Um, different points in memory. Um, and to keep the math from really degenerating here, let's talk about 32-bit systems for now. No worries, perfect, all good. I, I, we just need to kind of keep in mind the general idea of like, you know, memory structure and that sort of thing and and how you would read from memory and that sort of stuff. So as long as you kind of took a look at it, you're totally good. Um, so again, we're giving it a 32-bit systems for this example, just because 64-bit systems would make the numbers really small and they didn't show up on the projector really well last semester. So knowing that an ALU performs crucial operations that depend on the inputs it gets, Let's figure out how we'd access those inputs, right? So I'm sure everybody's familiar with computer memory structure. Um, and just like we kind of have thought about already, um, I just want everybody to know like what, what exactly like a memory address is, right? You got a lot of points in there, right? And you know, you're gonna have wires coming out of all of those, you know, quote unquote memory addresses, right? Because at the end of the day, we want to access those addresses. Um, and if you're gonna hit me with a technicality, like, oh, sometimes you need to read from disk or, or magnetic tape or something like that, same idea. And if you really wanna get technical, we could talk about looking at random access memory, right? Which which is, you know, just wired together. Um, so let's talk about that. Does anybody know how many memory addresses a 32-bit system would have? Just throw it, throw it in the chat if you've got it, or you can just Google it since you're on your computer. But I mean, it's exactly what you would expect it to have, right? That's two to the 32, so that's that really big nasty number. Um, and that, my friends, I just want you to take a take a moment here to think about. You know, at the end of the day, we're gonna have to access all these memory addresses, right? Um, so having this many wires would would really screw us over. Like, what? Who would ever take the time to to build? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's a lot of zeros. I'm not even sure what that number actually is but it's very much. Uh, so again, if we wanted to build an individual wire to access each of these memory addresses, we would be very high and dry, right? So what would the inside of our computers be like if we had a little wire connecting each of those individual memory addresses to the ALU? Because I, again, I want you to think about how computers would work, right? At the end of the day, when we're using an ALU, we need to maybe like perform an add on two memory addresses, perform like a subtract, right? Multiply, obviously there's some more stuff you could do, but let's talk about this first, right? So if we were to maybe end address 6 million with address 750 million, um, we would kind of be looking at um, this very technical diagram I have for you guys here. And this, it would just be spaghetti. There would be a lot of wires. <laughs> We have that many wires on either side of the mux and demux, though. Yes, but it turns out that is okay-ish, right? Just because we have that many nodes themselves. Does that make sense? For every for every access point, those would already exist. So the real problem here, Richard, is not the I guess the amount of wires, but the way they would crisscross over each other um, when heading back to the whatever location they needed to head to. Does that kind of make sense? That's kind of why I've got the spaghetti in here obviously yeah 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 the ultimate exactly the ultimate wire management obviously i'm kind of simplifying the example for you here right a lot of computers um leverage a lot a lot of advanced ways to move signals together and things like that um but this is a great way to think about it to start off with right and the reason i'm using this ridiculously large example is because that's that's just the general nature of computers these days right the scale at which we build them is massive uh, in terms of the digital logic components, right? So it's important to think very big um, when we're considering this. And thanks to Moore's law, these numbers are not going to get any smaller. If I were to try and do this presentation in 10 years, I would assume these numbers would not fit on the screen at all, right? Um, so again, it would look like spaghetti because you'd have a bunch of stuff crisscrossing over each other. And that is really when the mux would be highly useful. So instead of having around 4 million individual wires, oh, was it four? Okay, all right. We can use a multiplexer, right? So how much would that cut us down to? Again, I want everybody to recall the two to the power of 32, right? Um, and consider how much a multiplexer would cut us down, right? Just to sort of think about it, 
right, Brian, you had the right numbers there when you were taking a look at it. Excellent. Yes, that is indeed what we're we're getting at, right? Oh, okay, looks like I have some more <laughs> some more stuff about this, right? 32 bit architecture. Um we only need one output wire and 32 selector wires. I I really I don't know why I put Zooey Mama in here. I thought it would be funny if I said it out loud. Um but it's, it's not really working for me now. Um, that joke usually hits better in person. That does. <laughs> But yeah, no, absolutely right. So can and I just want to make sure everybody kind of gets why we're hitting one output wire and 32 selector wires, right? The key is in knowing that we have two to the 32 total addresses that we need to be touching, right? That is 4 million condensed down to 33. That is a massive improvement, right? And of course, modern ALUs do way more than just add, subtract, and simple logic gates. So this sort of implementation is highly useful for us, right? Okay, so now we've got the numbers in the ALU, and we've we've screwed around with them a fair bit. And, you know, just, just to kind of consider, how do you think it gets put back in memory, right? So now we need, like, you know, these 33 wires coming out of the, uh, the ALU, and we want to put them back in the right spot. That is where we are probably going to uh, leverage a demultiplexer, right? Um, obviously, I just want to add as a disclaimer, I don't think any computer is actually built like this, right? This is kind of just a real-world example. Um, that could potentially be useful. I just want to make sure everybody's kind of thinking big um, on that order of things, right? So again, there are different ways to build multiplexers, not just the end gate stuff that we have earlier, um, especially on a much larger scale. Um, but this is a good way to sort of get started with it, right? So food for thought. Multiplexing and demultiplexing is not just a thing in digital logic, right? It's hugely useful for us in other realms as well. I'm sure all of you have internet cables coming into your house. Right? That's how you're attending this lecture, unless you're using cellular or something. But that's one thing, right? Internet kind of gets sent on, you know, the, the fiber cable, right? That's multiplexed, right? If you if you get FiOS or whatever, or Xfinity, depending on where you live, um, right? And how do you think phone calls are made on landlines, right? There is not an actual singular wire that connects your landline to every other phone in the world. That is one of the oldest examples of multiplexing, right, um, and demultiplexing. As you can imagine, your phone signal gets sent to other phones by leveraging something like this, right? Because if you think about it, this is somewhere where multiplexing would totally come in handy, right? Um, your whatever you're saying does not go through multiple phone inputs. It just goes through one phone input and it has to come out one phone output. So totally conducive to multiplexing. Right, obviously there are some some additional structures in place to make sure that two people can have the same like can have phone calls at the same time. But the idea is sort of the same, right? And you know, if you remember cable TV, I'm not sure if this is too old now when we talk about it, but you'd usually have this like coax cable coming into your uh uh, your TV from the wall, right? That is also an excellent way to get like so many channels over one singular cable by multiplexing, right? Um, and of course, there are many ways to multiplex, right? Um, across like radio waves and frequencies, that I, there, that kind of escapes the um, the uh, what is that the the scope of this class? Um, so really, we're we're just going to consider the um the digital logic way of multiplexing and demultiplexing. But this is a very common sort of methodology to condense these um, <clears throat> um variety of signals all the way down as we send them across somewhere. It's kind of like a neat way of using an encoder and a decoder, I guess, in a, in a strange sort of relatable way. That's why we can have the um the lectures adjacent. To each other so that's that's kind of what i got oh is there an example when you use muxes and demuxes multiple signals simultaneously in fact yeah there are there are um lots of examples right i guess one from this class is um when we're adding numbers right when we want to represent binary with like four wires then we're kind of high and dry right um if we want two of those to be on at the same time mux isn't going to work for that i guess we kind of are left in that case to extend the four wires that we need right so if we wanted to realistically transport binary across a long distance we might even want to consider converting it to decimal sending it down a mux and then getting it out of a demux and then converting it back to binary question mark that might be a way to do it if we wanted a really long distance transfer but there are ways to kind of get around that 
Aki, I've pulled up my uh, Project Four World in Minecraft. If we just want to show like a, a quick analog, like that is like perfect. a tutorial just to like show like how a mux would look. That is perfect, man. That that sounds like a great thing to talk about here. Let me yeah. let me share my screen. Okay, perfect. Let me switch over to your stream. I'll stop mine. Um, and if you have any questions about muxes and demux, just ask him in the in the lecture questions chat so that Ashwat can get through his example. Yes, okay. Yeah, do you Minecraft for now? Yep, okay, it should be on the lecture okay. video. Cool. Um, so you'll notice over here is, this is actually Project 4, this is what you're going to be building, but you'll notice that everything under this like crisscross of like rows on top is actually Projects 1 through 3. These are AND gates over here, or OR gates, XOR gates, um, NOT gates, adders, and there's a multiplier over there. Um, but basically, what this does over here, this is a 4-bit selector. And so there are different operation codes. And you can mess with these switches to tell uh, your ALU what operation to do on those two that those two 3-bit numbers. So the current selected operation code is the code for 0, which is, I believe, XOR. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, no, 0 is it. No, zero is and apparently. Okay, so zero is whatever I put on these. So let's just do like one and one, and you'll see the the result comes out as one on the last bit. But if I switch one off, that last bit powers off because this system is currently being told I only want the and instruction for whatever these inputs are, and so that's essentially like muxes and demux. Demux is like in a nutshell for what we're going to be doing in, in this class. Like these four selector bits are being converted to decimal along these rows over here. And the implementation of this, there's actually a video of this that uh, I will link you to that I made last semester. But essentially these torches act as, uh, I'm not sure if you guys remember 250, but essentially the visualization of this is instead of doing it uh, like the circuit showed in Aki's slide where it's, uh, not A and, not B and, not C and, not D go into, um, or I forget, is it is it not, or it could just be and. But I think it's just and, yeah, into a big and. end. Mm -hmm. So in this, we're actually doing it as not or, which if you expand that out, De Morgan's makes it A and B and C and D, which is uh, essentially what happens when we flip the current over here. And so if we if we not everything, this is essentially the uh, a pretty clean implementation of a mux slash demux. Yeah, definitely go with this one and don't emulate the the lecture slides perfectly just because this looks a lot nicer in Minecraft. Yeah, unfortunately, like we, we can't provide like direct analogs like the doing the circuit like exactly how it's shown on the slide would just be completely overkill. And it's it's a lot more than what you need to do. This is like probably the most clean implementation of this that I've seen. And uh, I, I definitely recommend you go you go this route. Uh, again, again, I'll link the videos on how to do this. And there's some pretty clean logic on the other end of this, where these torches up here, and then there's this like little contraption of this, which if you feed your outputs, um, that's what makes it so that this will only power this row and feed it into the output bus if uh, this thing is on. So definitely watch that. I have like a set of two tutorials that are like, I think five minutes each. One about the demux and mux, the other one about like this little contraption that feeds into the output bus. So those will be linked to the project four spec whenever that comes out. That'll be like next week or whatever. I, I release project three late, but uh, yeah, just keep, keep keep an eye out for that. Yeah, no worries. We should be totally good on time for releasing project. So should be all good. And by the way, if anybody needs extensions or anything, feel free to let us know in advance. Um, that is also totally cool. <laughs> Just, just hit us up probably via Discord or something, and we'll we'll go ahead and, and take care of it. But yeah, awesome. Yeah, that was all I had. Cool. Excellent. Okay. Um, let me close that stream up. And I think that's kind of all we've got Ashwat's note about the um, I definitely go with his tutorial right um it's a little so obviously I didn't represent um the diagrams here with 
uh, using or gates and not gates just because of De Morgan's law. It's just it turns out that De Morgan's law works a lot better um, to our advantage when building a diagram um, to just use and gates, but when using Minecraft, it works a lot better just to uh, to use or gates that are inverted. I mean, you got you guys the project one. You know how much of a pain it is it would have been to build all those AND gates and connect them to the output. OR gates are literally just connecting wires together. There's there's literally no no work involved. So if you can invert the result of OR gates and make it an AND gate, it's just uh, it's like the chef's kiss. That's exactly what we want. Exactly, yeah. So okay, so I think that's that is all we've got for today. I can stick around a little bit to take questions because I I have another class that I usually have, but I think it got canceled. So kind of chilling um yeah i suppose that's it so stick around if you have any questions but thanks for coming ashwat you got anything else dad nope. I'll, I'll probably create an extra credit quiz do at midnight Ooh, uh perfect and then you guys can submit that sweet all right oh no it's due it's due next thursday dude it's on the <laughs> Don't worry about it. I, I released it literally yesterday, so don't. It's not due Monday. Yeah. Um. Just make sure. To, yeah. Exactly. Like, don't worry about the projects. Right. If you just click the link and and look at the project spec itself. Ashwat, I think I threw it up on the website, so we should be good there. Okay. Cool. And I also preemptively made an um submission for it because the department hasn't got back to me regarding the server. Excellent. Okay. I maybe we should. Yeah. I'll, I'll see if I can move that up along. Yeah. Solid. Okay. All right, thanks for coming, everybody. I guess I'll stick around until everybody dips, but...